اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحلل عقدت من لسانی یفقه قولی الحمدللہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ علی سیدنا و حبیب قلوبنا و شفیع نفوسنا اب القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد Respected scholars, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله For tonight's lecture I want to discuss a very important person which we commemorate tonight by the name of Abi Talib the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the father in which has been oppressed throughout history, not from our school of thought, but from the opposite school of theology and jurisprudence, in which they come forth and namely say that Ali ibn Abi Talib's father, Abi Talib, died as a kafir or died as a disbeliever. Now, inshallah, the progression of the lecture for tonight will be to analyze different examples and look at different ways in which we can disprove this and prove to everyone, insha'Allah, that Ali's father, Abi Talib, was a mu'min and one of the top of the mu'mineen of the time. And insha'Allah, we have points to discuss tonight. And insha'Allah, if the time doesn't prevail us, we'll have about six or seven points to talk about in defense of Ali ibn Abi Talib's father. Now, inshallah, to start off the lecture for tonight, please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first point I want to raise is in reference to a hadith by the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, in which he states, Ana wa kafu lil yateem kahatain fil jannah. And he mentions in reference to his fingers when he says, like these two in paradise, showing to us and giving us the example of the closeness that the Prophet will be to the person that sponsors an orphan. Now the question I want to raise inshallah for tonight is to make everyone remember the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, was he or was he not an orphan? That's the first point. Now when the Prophet of Islam comes forth and states that me and the sponsor of an orphan are like this in heaven. Should we not remember who actually sponsored the Prophet of Islam? Should we not look into who took charge of taking care of the Prophet of Islam when he was a yateen? What is it anyone except Abi Talib? When he took him on board, that's the first point I want to raise for tonight, is that the, in reference to the Prophet's hadith in which he says, me and the sponsor, I like this in heaven. We must remember who actually sponsored the Prophet of Islam. That's number one. Number two is a very delicate point, And we have to think about it very, very precisely. Because the Prophet of Islam, in the early stages when people were coming towards Islam, you find that anyone that was married, if a woman would come towards Islam, and the husband did not, the Prophet of Islam would divorce them. Listen to this point. And if in the opposite agenda, if the Prophet of Islam finds that a man comes to Islam and the woman is still not Muslim, he would divorce them. Therefore, we know, and no one differentiates in the idea that Ali ibn Abi Talib's mother was one of the top Muslims, was one of the muhajirin of the time. No one disagrees with this. Now, the point I should raise and the argument that we have is if this is a point that we must raise about Abi Talib, why is it if we know that Ali ibn Abi Talib's mother was a Muslim and one of the greatest, why is it that the Prophet of Islam did not divorce them? That's the second point. That's the second argument that we may have. On the third argument is the concept of mercy. And the concept of mercy we find, the first example, is the Prophet of Islam doesn't say his mercy or doesn't give his mercy to disbeliever. And the example we have is the daughter of 
Hatim al Ta'i, when she is captured as a slave of war and brought towards the Prophet of Islam. And her name was Safana. She comes and she talks to the Prophet. She says, O oh, Prophet of Islam. She calls him by his name. I'm saying it because in respect of the Holy Prophet. She calls him by his name. And she says, I am the daughter of Hatim al Ta'i. My father's characteristics are very known within the Arabs. And she begins to say, my father's characteristics is A, B, C, D. The Prophet, look at what he says, because I want to take the wording of the Prophet of Islam. The Prophet wasallam says, these are the merits or the characteristics of a Muslim. No doubt, your father's characteristics, his character, his personality, his traits was that of a Muslim. Then he goes on to say what? Look at this particular instance. He says, if he was a Muslim then we would have sent our mercy. لو كان مسلما لترحمنا عليه If he was a Muslim, we would send our mercy, our prayers towards him. However, he goes on to say he wasn't a Muslim, therefore we can't send our mercy to him. Then what does he say? He doesn't let her go. He says, in honor of the character of your father, I will free you as a captive of war. In honor of your father. And all those that are with you, O Safana, I free in honor of you and your stand. That's the Prophet of Islam. Now take that into analogy. The Prophet doesn't give his rahmah, his mercy, to anyone that's not Muslim. Now let's look at another story and try to match it up with Abu Talib. In another analogy, a person comes from Al Badiya and he comes to the Prophet of Islam in his mosque and he says, O Prophet of Islam, the drought has destroyed our crops. Will you not raise your hands in prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he can bring forth the rain? So the Prophet of Islam, he raises his hands. The narration says, he prays to Allah. He says, before his hand comes to his neck, the rains were gushing out of the sky like a fountain. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Then three days pass and the rains are gushing and gushing until floods begin to happen. The same person comes to the Prophet of Islam. He says, O oh, Prophet of Islam, he says, we're not ready for such rain. We're not ready for this amount of water from the skies, from the heavens. Not, not ready for this much amount of blessings. Will you not stop the rain or is there any way that you can only let the rain go towards our crops? Our houses are flooding. Now look at this beauty, and this is Prophet with brothers and sisters. The Prophet وسلم, raises his hands and he says, Oh Allah, make it rain not on us, but only around us. And at that very moment they were in Medina and you find the rain stops on top of them. However, it's still raining in and around them. And the man, can you imagine, he's looking at the Prophet of Islam and he's seeing this particular miracle at that particular state. When the Prophet sees this as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him that which he wished, he smiles. Then he says this word. He says, Rahim Allah Ammiya Aba Talib. In reference to the first, what did he say? He says, we do not give our mercy towards the disbelievers. In this instance, what does he say? May Allah have mercy on my uncle, Abu Talib. That's number three. Number four, and I start to get more and more into depth. Number four is a very important one. Because it's in reference to the date that we have now, the date system that we have now. As we know, everything we know nowadays, 1436 after Hijrah. Let's look at the concept of Hijrah and why the Prophet of Islam actually migrated. As we said on the first point, the Prophet of Islam's main protector, the Prophet of Islam's main guardian, the main sponsor was Abi Talib, wasn't it? Now let's find why is it that 10 years, after, 10 years or 11 years as narrations differ after the Ba'tha, the Prophet of Islam had to migrate, in which the migration is known, now known as the Hijrah. And that, why is it that year that he called that year that he migrated, or that year that particular people died and led to the migration or being the sole or pivotal point for the migration of the Prophet. Two people died that year. The Prophet called the entire year that year of sorrow and sadness, Amil Huz. We find the first person that died was his wife, his beloved wife. 
in which he was not married to anyone else whilst he was married to Khadija. Likewise, Ali ibn Abi Talib was not married to anyone while he was married to Sayyidah Fatima. When we find that, the second person that dies is his protector, his sponsor, the person that used to protect him in Mecca. And the reason why he left the Sharp and the pivotal point of why he left is because his protector is no longer there. There is no longer protection for him there. He must go somewhere that he will get protection. Finding the importance of such a man, of his sponsor, of his guardian at the time, Abi Talib. That's the fourth point. Number five, and this is very beautiful. People come forth and say, well, he was his uncle. That's one point. He was his uncle. He has to take care of him. He has to be his sponsor. He has to be in charge of him because there's a certain level, if you're not in Islam, there's a certain level of characteristics within Arabs. He says it's his family. Now the question arises, why is it that in Islam, when we find that Abi Talib, in his own household, every single time within Islam, the Prophet would be sleeping in his bed, every couple of hours he'd change with Jafar, he'd change with Aqeel, he'd change with Ali. Why? The Prophet asks him, says, why do you keep changing me at night? He says, just in case the disbelievers the people that are attacking you know where you are sleeping and want to kill you. I'd prefer, look at this, I'd prefer that Allah or I'd prefer that a person from my family is killed, from my sons is killed, rather than you. Now if a person loves his, son, his, his brother's son, his nephew, he loves him, not, not a problem, but a love in such a level that he would put his own children to die for him, there has to be something that he knew. There has to be something that he has in the back of his mind, a deeper knowledge that he had. When we find in the brother's school of thought and in their hadith, we find that Abu Talib, as they say, Billah Abu Talib is in hellfire and his brain is roasting on the hellfire. However, we find one of the other Enemies, not the people that took care of the Prophet. One of his enemies, whether it be Abu Lahab or whether it be Abu Jahal, I can't exactly remember. One of his enemies, also a family. He says, this one Friday he gets, I think, a gift or some sort. Why? Because he was happy on the day that the Prophet was born. He gets something, but the protector doesn't get anything. He's in hellfire. Look at, look at the balance that they have. And what kind, of, what kind of people were they, their uncles to him? When we have one ayah in the Holy Qur'an that comes down. Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. And there's a funny story behind it because these ideologies that they try to instill in us, these stories that they try to instill in us to say that hey, Abu Talib wasn't a Muslim, he died outside of Islam. Look at the people that are trying to narrate it. As we know, Taghiyat al-Araq at the time, Saddam. I'll give you a, a small story narrated by one of the khutaba. His name is Sayyid al-Fali and he narrates this story. He says, back in Iraq when we were in Hawza, he says that we had a scholar go up on the pulpit and say, and analyze the speech when he started to say at the start of his speech, Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. He says that night, the people of Saddam went towards this person's house. And they says, you're Sayyid such and such? He says, yes. He says, come out. They drag him and beat him all the way towards the courtroom. After beating me, he says, what have I done? Because at the time, they were very specific about what they say. He says, what have you done? And they come to him and they say, says, Sayyid, he says, yes, you said Tabat Yada today about Abi Lahab? He says, yes. He says, therefore, you have cursed the Arabs. At that time, there was a whole feud between, in reference to the war. And you find he says, what? He says, you're cursing the Arabs. And that's punishable. He says, where have I cursed the Arabs? He says, Abu Lahab, you've cursed Abu Lahab. Is he, is he an Arab or is he non-Arab? He says, Abu Lahab's Arab, but I'm referencing the Qur'an. He says, I'm reading a verse from the Holy Qur'an. I haven't taken anything from my pocket. He says, no, you've cursed the Arabs. And that led to his death. Look at the ideologies, brothers and sisters. It makes you laugh on one angle, but on the other angle does make you cry. That's the ideologies. That's the thought process that they try to instill into people. Qur'an, no. This is my idea. Hadith, no, this is my idea. The Prophet said such and such. He says, no, 
This is what I think. And that's the danger, brothers and sisters. When we take into reference the two different accounts, when we look at the Prophet of Islam in a beautiful narration, Abu Talib comes into the house and he says to the Prophet of Islam, he says, oh my brother's son, he says the people of Quraysh say that you have put down their idols, you have corrupted the people's minds, you are turning a brother against one another, all for the sake of your new message. He says, will you not leave it? This is the narration. And the Prophet of Islam, he has a beautiful reply. What does he say? He says, لو أعطيت. He says, يا عم لو أعطيت الشمس بيميني والقمر في شمالي على أن أترك هذا الأمر أو ما أنا عليه ما تركته. I would not have leave it. If you've given me the sun in my right hand, if they put the sun in my right hand and put the moon in my left, for me to leave this path, I would not leave it. Then what does Abu Talib reply? This is the beauty. Abu Talib replies with a beautiful sentence. He says, he says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he says, as far as I am alive, no one will come towards you until I am buried under this dirt. Until I'm buried under this dirt, no one will harm you. Imagine if Abu Talib wasn't believing in this particular message. Would he be prepared to die for it? That's the point I want to raise. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ And he says himself, وَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ أَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ خَيْرْ أَدْيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ صَلَّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ That's who, whose words? Any particular person? That's Abu Talib's words when he comes to the Prophet of Islam. I end on this note, brothers and sisters. Those are the examples that we need to learn from. These are the examples, inshallah, that we seek to respond to anyone that comes forth and says, well, Abu Talib died as a non-believer. Abu Talib died as a kafir. You reply and say this. You say, this is Abu Talib. And another point I'd like to raise is, remember what we said a few nights ago? About the son and the father relations, Imam Zain al-Abidin, what does he say? Imam Zain al-Abidin says, the father is the root and the son is but a branch. And you find anything in yourself that pleases you, know that the root of that blessing is your father. Who was Abi Talib's son? Ali. What can we say about Abi Talib and his traits and characteristics? I leave it to you. I leave that example to you. You can look at it in any depth that you want. Any depth that you want. When we find other people are given pulpits, such as Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah and Yazid, however, they can't find a dot on Ali ibn Abi Talib from his wisdom to his eloquence, to his stances, to the battlefield. They can't find the little dot. They chose to attack his father. And that's the main reason. Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram, what did they say? They say, we, he said, Has, have I done anything? Have, is there a halal that I've made haram? Is there anything that I have done against my grandfather, the Prophet of Islam and his message? What was the reply? He says, we fight you bughvan li abik. We fight you in hatred of your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. What's this hatred? It's been carried down and it's been taught generation after generation just to have a glimpse or something against the uh, against Ali ibn Abi Talib in a small instance but how is it that the sun is bright and the clouds do not cover the sun and subhanallah and inshallah we take from the examples from tonight we have these in the back of our minds to have as references to have as an argument to represent our Madhab, to represent what we believe in, to represent Ali ibn Abi Talib and his firmness against the religion and the firmness of his father Abi Talib. And inshallah, we pray to Allah on this note. I've taken much of your time and inshallah, I give the opportunity to the Shaykh to come and enlighten us with his wisdom. But we pray with the Fatiha, inshallah. But before it, three of your loudest salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.